All right, so I got a tripod today, so it's moving up, I guess. Um, anyways, I want to talk about uh, breaking up with somebody who is a, an emotional manipulator. Um, this could be just a borderline, a narcissist, just there's a, a number of different types of people they could be. Um, but mostly from somebody who's a narcissist or a borderline. Uh, remember, always remember that if you're dealing with somebody who's a narcissist, you've got somebody that's borderline at their core and they have attempted to mitigate the uh, the pain of the, the borderline emotional pains. They've attempted to mitigate it through excessive self-improvement uh, and self-idolizing and, uh, you know, pumping themselves up. So, um First of all, if you're dealing with somebody who's an emotional manipulator, um, as always, uh, you have to understand how emotional manipulation works. It works by your participation, okay? So the very act of interaction is how manipulation occurs. If you don't want to be manipulated, then you cannot interact with the manipulative person. Without your interaction, manipulation cannot occur. So if you interact with somebody who is manipulative, you are setting yourself up to be manipulated because manipulative people generally don't want people in their lives that they can't control, okay? Because it's a control thing, right? So manipulative people have no use for people that they cannot control, so, uh, by that very definition, you want to be somebody that they cannot control because if you can't, if they can't control you, they have no use for you. And if they have no use for you, then they'll leave you alone, which, which is what you want. So your goal is to become uncontrollable. And the issue is for many of us just starting out, many of us are just now discovering that we are being manipulated in terrible ways. And it's not something that you can just snap your fingers and be like, I'm going to be uncontrollable. You can't, it's just not something that, that is immediately apparent. So I'm going to give you guys some tips and tricks on how to um, expel manipulative people, particularly romantic partners, let's say a boyfriend, girlfriend, or a spouse. Um, not always necessarily applicable for the workplace, but this is just mostly dealing with spouses uh, and, and uh, romantic partners. Okay. So step one, it's, it's interaction based, right? So you cannot interact with this person period. Okay. And so if you cut them off, you either block their number. Um, <clears throat> one of the, the good ways, the, the best method that I've ever come up with, um, and it's my favorite one is give your phone to someone you trust. Uh, trust me, the world is full of people with smartphones. If ever there's an emergency, there will be a dozen phones and at least five of them recording video. So you really don't need a phone like you think you do. So give it to somebody who you trust. Um, get a burner phone as like a, a temporary solution. So one of these like uh, pay by the month kind of things. It, that That's in the... the, the worst case scenario you can get a, a like a google number for free or something like that and that way voice calls you can still have voice calls and voicemail from people uh that you know um come into that so i like to tell people to give their phone to somebody else it doesn't take long it just takes a couple of weeks right so if you do this three weeks you will be pretty much cured of this person uh, is all it takes so if you're willing to invest three weeks of time, you can avoid dealing with somebody for months on end. So it's a really good trade-off. Um, this, like I said, this has worked for numerous people. So if you're having trouble getting somebody out of your life, just consider that. You know, three weeks without a phone to be done with somebody, or let it perpetuate for months and months and months, or however long, uh, until you figure it out on your own. Uh, it's just much easier to give your phone to somebody, 
Um, but again, you don't have to, it's just a good idea. The other thing I, I recommend is whatever friend you entrust with your phone, have them change your social media passwords, your email passwords, um, all of those things. Uh, and here's why. You just, you want to go completely off the radar 100%, te 100% off the, the technological radar. Um, because when, an, when a manipulator can't reach you by phone or by text, they start looking for the other ways to reach you. They'll start, uh, you know, saying, hey, I'm worried about so-and-so. Have you heard from them? I'm actually just kind of worried, right? So, you know, it, it helps that if people in your circle know uh, what's going on, you know, some of them, eventually just be like, yeah, you know, he's, he's doing fine. Yeah, no, he's just focused on doing stuff. You don't tell him that you're without your phone. Just say, yeah, you know, he's got a lot of, you know, he's got a lot of great things going on right now. He's just, you know, um, they're, you know, they're, they're hustling, you know? Yeah, but he's fine, they're alive. So they're alive and doing great. That's what you have people tell them, you know? So, but have them change all your social media passwords, your email passwords, etc. You don't need them like you think you do. Um, and again, this is just strictly because when, when you, manipulative people don't like to lose someone that they can control. They don't. So what they're going to do is they're going to look and look and look and look and try to find a string to pull. And quite frankly, a phone is best described as a portal for emotional abuse. Okay. So anything a phone can access, that's a portal where abuse can come in. It's plain and simple. So the less you can do on a phone or technology, the better. Consider it a technological cleanse. And yes, that is a real thing. Um, but you know, you, you do, you do this, uh, and, um, uh, and I, I can assure you that it, it works. Um, if, if you're in an extreme case in, in extreme cases, let's say you do the whole three week cleanse, whatever, and you get your phone back, you change your passwords and this person starts immediately like coming back into your life. If, if you haven't healed enough in three weeks where you, you're, you're still weak around them, then the next step you should do, instead of getting all of your old social media accounts back, just create new ones. By now, I mean, most everybody has multiple accounts anyway, since Facebook started swinging the hammer on people and putting people in Facebook jail. I think most everybody now has at least two social media accounts, right? Just create another one. Um, yeah, just create another one. Uh, and... The first thing you do create it and the first thing you want to do is block this manipulative person and from there they they're none the wiser especially if you know this manipulative person's other accounts right so and there you go um now if you're say married to somebody who's manipulative and you're looking to get out of marriage that's trickier um the best advice I can give you, uh, so several things uh, when you're looking at separation and divorce from somebody who's manipulative, before you do anything, you want to find an attorney, retain the attorney, and then file for divorce or separation, whatever it is in your state. In most states, there's a cool down period, right? So here in Texas, I believe it's 60 days, right? So if you file for divorce in Texas, once that's filed, you're forced to wait a mandatory 60 days as a quote, cool down period to make sure that it's something you really want to do. Okay. So a lot, a lot of, a lot of times there's this misconception that once you file for divorce, like bam, it's on. No. Um, but when you're going through a divorce with somebody who's manipulative, um, they're, they're, your reality is easily manipulated. And so if you're trying to get yourself through a divorce and dealing with somebody who can mold and, and alter and change your reality and, and your way of thinking, it's not a good, uh, it's not a good formula for success, okay? Because you will get sabotaged at every turn.
So before you do anything, before you before you open a new bank account, before you touch the money, before you cancel any debit cards, before you take out a new lease, before you say, fuck you, motherfucker, and walk out, before you do any of that stuff, find an attorney, retain the attorney, and then if there's a cool down period in your state, consider filing. In a divorce, you do not ever want to be the second person to a lawyer. Remember that. You always want to be the first person to an attorney. You want to be the requester, not the respondent. Okay? Um, so that's how you find an attorney, retain the attorney. Trust me on this. If you don't, if you try to do it on your own for a little while and, and, and wait till the last second, most assuredly, you will make a string of mistakes that will cost you more money in the end to correct. It happens all the time. Um, most of the time, even after the divorce is final, within a year or two, you're back in court because somebody is, is disputing the division of property. Okay? So, getting it right from the beginning uh, is absolutely essential. And you want to be the one to file the divorce because you can file and then with that cool down period, you can always change your mind. It is money well spent. The majority of attorneys, especially if you say, this is what I want to do, but I'm not sure if I want to move forward, but I want to retain you. And then can we just talk about like a split retainer where how much would you charge just to, you know, file my divorce papers and let that be that. And then if I decide to move forward, uh, pay the rest of the retainer. Would you do a split retainer like that? Most of the time, if you're dealing with somebody who's reasonable and they understand this strategy, um, you'll be fine. Okay. Not every attorney I think would agree to that, but I'm pretty sure, I mean, there are people too. You say, I'm not sure I want to move forward with the divorce, but I want to go ahead and get it filed because I want to be the first person on the record. Pretty sure an attorney will understand that strategy, right? Um, so, there's that. The other thing, and then uh, I'll leave you with this. Let's say you do go through the divorce um, or go through with the divorce. Um, obviously, it's very emotional, uh, very upsetting. There's a lot of back and forth. The divorces tend to get very heated. There's a lot of high emotions, a lot of empty threats. Um, I just want to discuss the biggest empty threat uh, and uh, just generally the nature of divorces and, and lawsuits and all of this. So in court with, with, with lawsuits and everything, everything, the more you can get uh, determined in the beginning, uh, the better, right? So you, you don't want it to be one of these figure shit out as you go. Um, it, everything, you have to know everything in the beginning, right? Um, so uh, let me give you example, I lost my train of thought because I've got children running up and down the hall. Um, what is my point? Um, you want to have, you know, you want to be the one to file your divorce. Um, there's a lot of, of empty threats. So, so in the beginning, you're, what you're going to find is that on the initial filing, there's going to be a whole lot of scary language. And most of that scary language really doesn't mean a whole lot. It's laying out uh, the landscape of what's going to happen, right? So you're going to see some language about uh, people being thrown in jail, um, people this that, and the other, a whole bunch of money. There's a lot of scary sounding language uh, in a divorce petition. Um, if you're the one responding to a divorce and you're seeing all this language about being thrown in jail and, and all this other stuff, um, the language is scarier than it actually is. You know, is because if you don't ask for it in the very, very beginning, you can't really ask for it later. So if you if if you start with this divorce and you say in, in your divorce filings, oh they 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 beat me, they hit on me, they did all this stuff. 
but you know i don't ever want to see him or her go to jail because you know that i, I think that would be wrong well later on if you're really really irritated with this person and if they really push themselves too far you can't be like well now i'm interested in jail right you can't do that right so there's all of this language about jailing and fees and um contempt of court and and all this other stuff because it has to be sort of declared in the beginning you know it doesn't doesn't do well to string get along so um, if you're responding and if you're if you're if you're filing for divorce all that language is is going to probably scare the shit out of the other person and if you're on the receiving end just relax okay because it's really not uh all it's it's not all that it uh it sounds like um it could be if they file for enforcement if you do something and, and you fuck up but again, that's why you have an attorney. So you should not be speaking to somebody that you're going in through a divorce with because all you're going to do is reveal your strategy to the other team. Okay, You don't see football coaches uh, yelling their strategies to the other football coaches like, oh yeah, well, let's see you take, I bet you won't be able to, uh, to defeat this next running play or whatever the hell, right? You know, you don't see baseball coaches being like, I bet you won't be able to hit this screwball my pitcher's about to throw. No. Right? So don't don't talk to this person you're going through a divorce with. Okay? Uh, there's a great saying. You have the right to remain silent, but if you don't have the ability, then you're going to lose. Right? So just because you have the right to remain silent doesn't always mean you have the ability to remain silent. You have the right to do it, so do it. And it's a lot harder than you would think, but you must, okay? This is why you have an attorney, okay? Uh, and the last thing I'll leave with is the hollow threats of, well, tell it to the judge. I'll see you in court. I'm sure, let's see what the judge thinks about this, right? People are always like, well, tell it to the judge. They, they always in, invoke the judge. Like the judge is going to give, like the judge is ever going to care about your bullshit. Uh, judges don't. Uh, when you go into family court, the judges are most interested in dealing with people who are like, uh, you know, wife beaters, child molesters, child abusers, issues of neglect, beaten children, beaten wives, uh, battered husbands. That's a thing, too. Um, I've been there. Uh, so, uh, you know, all of these very, very serious uh, um, uh, cases are going to be going through the family court. So... If you end up in front of a judge and the judge is like, OK, uh, why are you here? And be like, well, because I told them that I would that they could tell that tell it to the judge. And I told them that I would see them in court. And so today's the day I'm seeing them in court. Uh, no, the, the judge isn't going to give a shit about your bullshit drama. They really don't. They don't want to hear it in the majority, the majority of the time, not necessarily all the time, but just the, the average divorce where there's not, uh, you know, there's not a lot of violence going on. There's no criminality. There's no children being beaten or eaten, uh, any of that stuff. In the typical divorce, here's what's going to happen. You're going to go to mediation and you're going to be forced to agree with somebody. And then your mediated agreement goes to the court. So the judge is like, oh, OK, I see you want a divorce. Are there any serious issues here? Are you all just normal people? Great. Go to mediation, figure it out, okay? If mediation fails and you do have the right to walk out of a mediation, you can go back to the judge and you can say, we tried to mediate uh, and it, it fell, you know, it failed. But we want to try again, right? You can always tell a judge, you know what, mediation didn't work out. I think we can reach an agreement. I'd like to try another round of mediation, okay? Judges will almost always agree to let you two work it out. Sometimes a divorce can go back for two or three or even four mediations. It's not uncommon. Uh, well, four might be uncommon, but it's not impossible, okay? But for most of the time, if, if one of the two parties is willing to try and come to an agreement with the other one, and you say, hey, we'd like to try again, the majority of the time, judges will permit that unless there's some sort of serious mitigating factor uh, involved with that. So just understand that all of this talk back and forth, the, the high emotions and all that, um, neither you nor this other person 
really are going to be able to throw their weight behind having you, the other one thrown in jail. You can't just have somebody thrown in jail. You can't call an employer and have somebody fired. Uh, you can't you can't do any of those things. You can't even force somebody to tell it to the judge. You can't even usually even get a judge's opinion on a specific instance, right? It's because you took the PlayStation with you, right? So, no, um, the judges just aren't going to care about that. Um, it's very, very difficult to prove contempt of court. So if somebody says, you know, you, you can't really tell somebody, well, you're in contempt, right? I'm going to, you, you'll be found in contempt, all this other stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it can, it, 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 it can get to that point. But if you're not purposefully being a dick, um, getting a finding of contempt is actually fairly difficult. Not impossible. It's just, it's, it's work. There has to be like a real solid case. There's a lot of criteria to it. It's not just something you can flippantly threat somebody with. It's not something that you can just flippantly be threatened by either. Okay, so the whole find, being found in contempt isn't, um, isn't necessarily, uh, um, it's, it's not really a solid threat. It can be, but if it's just in the heat of an argument, uh, don't sweat it too much. And that's why you have your attorney, right? Because you already retained an attorney, okay? So always just check with them. Um, but in general, if you're dealing with somebody who's difficult, don't tell them some shit like, you know, I'll find you in contempt. Because again, that's just you revealing your strategy to the other team. You're telling them the shit you don't like. So they know what's going to, you know, what grinds your gears. So the more you try to threaten somebody... And I'm, I'll find you in contempt, blah, blah, blah. They're just taking notes. Like, okay, I know what they hate. And you're, and you're just perpetuating the cycle, right? And that goes back to the very, very beginning. Uh, people can't manipulate you if you don't participate. Things just go better without your participation, especially a divorce. You pay an attorney. You don't have to talk to this other person. You really don't. Your attorney represents you. So you just tell them, look, if it's something urgent... You can call my attorney, tell my attorney your urgent shit, and they'll relay it to me. I'm not speaking to you directly. I'm just, I'm not. You know, even if it's an emergency, just call my attorney in an emergency, okay? They'll know what to do. Uh, there's really no difference between me and my attorney, so call them. And you, you move on with your life, and you do not interact with this person. So thank you very much for listening. Please like, comment, or share. Um, you know, this is a, a topic I do from time to time just because I want for people to just have a, a periodic reminder that, you know, you don't have to be stressed. You don't have to worry about this person. You don't have to have all of this anxiety and anger and frustration. Um, there are actually very peaceful, serene uh, solutions to most of these issues. So uh, thanks again. Uh, please like, comment or share. I'll see you on the next video.